I'm very excited to welcome back Andy Schechtman to provide commentary on the headlines that are moving markets that just seem to be getting more and more outlandish. Welcome back, Andy. Good to see you again, Elliot. Thanks for having me, pal. No, I'm super excited to have you back again. And, you know, the first one, which is the Federal Reserve is still expected to take a very big step towards a rate hike. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think I've been pretty consistent in my feeling on that. I don't see it happening. I mean, look, you have the Senate Democrats that are seeking to increase the debt limit by another two and a half trillion dollars, which will only fund the government through early 2023. But, you know, the, the, the concept of how big these numbers are um, is insanity. You know, a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago, and they throw around uh, two and a half trillion, like it, it's no big deal. Uh, and they continue to raise the debt limit like it's no big deal. Uh, the amount of indebtedness that we see on every single level, especially starting with the government who is insolvent, who is spending money like a drunken sailor, uh, it, it's, it's complete and total insanity. And I think that if they try and raise, if they try and normalize, as they call it. I mean, if you want to speak in Fed speak, you're talking a very hard landing in which, you know, trying to get asset prices to return to normal um, in, in this environment would create a lot of hardship. You have over leveraged businesses that will go bankrupt. You have millions of people that will lose their homes and um, you know, the elite that they're trying to protect the market, you know, 20, 30 trillion, who pick a number, uh, you know, they've chosen, obviously, in my opinion, for a very long time, the markets over the health of the dollar. And you're talking an economy that would massively go through the ringer if they try to normalize. I can't think that they, I just can't see them normalizing. And what is what is tapering in an environment where they've been buying 150 trillion a month in uh, government bonds and securities? You know, what is it? A token 10 trillion, a 10 billion instead of, you know, they'll knock off 10 billion and, and make it uh, 140 billion. And this is what we know of, you know, who's to say they're not, you know, having their buddies in the Bahamas or in the Cayman Islands, rather, purchasing treasuries on behalf of them. The point of it is, is that you really, uh, arguably, we have gone past the point of no return in the respect that all of the assets out there, Elliot, are at such overvaluation, stocks and bonds and real estate at all time highs. And remember, you know, when I started in this industry in 1989, stocks and bonds were titled risk on, risk off. And so what you had by that was an inverse relationship. Uh, the thing of it is now is that stocks and bonds are no longer inversely correlated. And in fact, they're at all time highs along with the um, real estate market. If you try to raise rates, the first thing you do uh, is collapse the mother of all bubbles, the bond market, which will bring down with it kneecap totally uh, the stock market and the real estate market implodes. The three pillars of wealth will absolutely collapse if interest rates rise. So the question being is, what is normalized? In 2019, they tried it to gradually raise rates to 3% and hit 3% and the market absolutely collapsed. Uh, is that what they're gonna do this time? And as we talked about last week, Elliot, remember we talked about that Bank of America came out with a report saying that $900 billion went into equities last year, which is 100 billion more than the last 19 years combined. And when you have all of that energy going into this marketplace and you try to then cut it off with raising rates and tapering, and I shouldn't say by tapering, rates will rise by themselves. You see, the, the, the perverted world we live in, interest rates are created or maintained by a couple of fat white bankers who think they know what, what is best for the economy instead of letting the market uh, do it itself. In other words, the market is supposed to find an equilibrium, a fair balance between risk and return. That's what interest rates should be. Uh, we've reached that point now where if interest rates rise, it all blows up. I don't think they'll taper. And if they do, it'll be token at very best until the market pukes like it did in 19. And then they'll acquiesce and go back to doing the exact same thing that they've been doing before. Um, there'll always be a reason 
why they're not able to fully normalize their balance sheet. And you know, maybe it's Omicron right now, just like the Bank of England. The Bank of England was supposed to raise rates just the other day. And they came out and said that they're going to hold off because of Omicron. And, uh, you know, maybe till February, they'll revisit it. But my point is that when push comes to shove, they'll always find a reason to really not normalize because they can't any longer. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it. I think it's kind of just the power play by the Fed saying, look, we're still in control of this market. If we want deflation, we'll get deflation. And what's surprising is that so few people agree with you. They think they actually are going to taper, which is why gold and silver are going down. I would argue that it's, it's, this is the narrative that the elite or the bankers want us to follow. And so it's very easy to sell tremendous amounts of futures to drive the price down to support their narrative. At the same time, as the markets are going up, we talked about last week, you have record inside selling. Uh, you know, uh, Elon Musk just sold another billion dollars worth of stock for $11 billion and the CEO of Microsoft, 50% of his stock. Record CEO selling, they see what's coming. And what is gold but the canary in the gold mine? And so when you see the biggest money in the world acquiring gold and silver the way I do off of COMEX, the central banks, the commercial banks, the dr driving down of the price in it's such a counterintuitive measure is very transparent to me. Because if gold were to really be where it should be, the same with silver, you would have people running for the exit, seeing the dollar for what it is, peeking behind the curtain, so to speak, in the Wizard of Oz. And uh, honestly, I truly do believe that the, the, the price is completely and totally controlled by the crooked COMEX for now until it's not. Because honestly, the only way you can manipulate a market over an extended period of time is to push it in the direction it's going. And the world is looking for alternatives right now to fiat currency. Look what Russia and China are doing. Look what India is doing. They're spiking unilateral relationships in commerce, in trade, in in, in uh, oil and gas, and not only that, in military cooperation and, and military arms and sales of selling everything usurping the dollar. The world is getting wise to the devaluation of the dollar. And if they were to let gold and silver find its real equilibrium price, people would be fleeing for the exits like rats sink, uh, running from a sinking ship. Yeah, absolutely. And another complicating kind of factor here is is this Omicron variant like you did bring up. And just now the CDC warns that there could be a punishing wave in January of the new virus. And we remember what happened when everyone went in lockdown in March of 2020, you know, gold and silver markets went haywire and uh, premiums went through the roof and things like that. So just do you have a take on this well, there, new yeah. wave of, yeah. Yeah, well, there is your excuse to keep the same narrative going. It's not our fault, it's the virus's fault. You know, look, I, I, I believe that there is a fine line, Elliot, between conspiracy and reality these days, a very fine line. When I was talking about gold and silver manipulation for a very long time, even guys like Doug Casey would publicly say, that's not right. It, it, there's no way gold and silver could ever be manipulated. The traders could never keep their mouth shut long enough. Yet JP Morgan just paid a $960 million fine and admitted to manipulating the metals market. There is a fine line between it. A lot of people, would surmise, and, and again, it's a conspiracy, I get it, it's a theory, that everyone's economies blow up and there's your great reset and it isn't blamed on the fact that everything is over levered. It isn't blamed on the banks who, who literally destroyed the markets through a quadrillion dollars in derivatives. It's not blamed on the enrichment of all of the elite who sucked as much out of this system as they possibly could, being enriched for generations. And then we blow everything up and start over. It's blamed upon a virus. And this Omicron strain, which, you know, on one hand, you hear, yeah, it's contagious, but it's very, very not lethal. Um, they are um, using it as an excuse to continue the spending and the stimulus and, and more control of the public and, and loss of freedoms. And it's the exact same reason that the Bank of England postponed their tapering until maybe we'll look at it again in February because, because of Omicron. And so, look, I'm not a conspiratorialist, but when you see this same thing happening over and over and over again, it makes you wonder, what's the next screen going to be? What's the next thing that's going to come out that is going to allow them to continue to spend, to continue to keep interest rates low, to continue to manipulate and to continue to infringe upon our 
freedoms. And, you know, I don't know the exact term, but, and I don't want to butcher it, but, you know, Ben Franklin talked about when you give up freedoms for safety, you never get them back. It's the same reason why people still have to take their shoes off flying on an airplane, because you'll never get those freedoms back. It becomes the new normal. And I think people need to realize that, that this is becoming, I think, the new normal. And what we remember prior to 2020 probably won't ever come back. If this is the playbook that we will see where they use fear to control us and to continue to be allowed to spend and stimulate and keep interest rates low and suck as much out of this system as possible, um, I think it's, it doesn't bode well for the U.S. dollar, for this economy. And I think it, it creates a massive a dichotomy in wealth where in this environment, as I mentioned, I think that they are choosing the markets over the, the fate of the dollar. You have a K-shape where the poor are getting poor because they own no assets and the cost of living becomes exponentially more expensive. Food and energy and tuition and healthcare and uh, everything that we need becomes more expensive and inflated in this, in this condition. But the, the rich, well, they don't care that all that stuff's getting more expensive because their assets are going parabolic. And so they become enriched by this environment. And this is, to me, the path that we are on where you just have a, um, an evisceration of the middle class and of small businesses um, and a, a massive class war. Uh, you know, and I think it, it's a scary situation where... Um, you have an entire group of people that comprise this country, uh, small businesses and the middle class is the engine of this, of growth in the United States and you're eviscerating both. And I think this is, this is a, a big problem that I don't see ending if we continue to allow our freedoms to be uh, usurped and our, uh, allow our, our government to continue to, to, destroy the currency by printing and stimulus in, in ways that there's no way back from, in my opinion. Yeah. So the financialization of everything, the manipulation, what you're describing, the evisceration of the middle class, everyone is extremely agitated right now. And so I think, you know, the right and the left are pointing fingers at each other. They're really blaming each other. A study just came out saying that political polarization in the U.S. may be at an irreversible tipping point, meaning that it's to the point where there's no going back. And this comes after Ray Dalio, brilliant establishment hedge fund guy saying there's a 30% chance the US will break out into civil war in the next 10 years. So where does all that lead? Life is a cycle, Elliot, and uh, economies are cycles. And you have the good part of the cycle that's characterized by peace and prosperity and production and growth. And then you have the bad part that includes recession and depression and inflation and social conflict and ultimately war. And in the, in the example that I gave you, um, K-shape, you got people who got too much and people who got nothing. Uh, there's your civil war. You have red versus blue, vaccine versus not. You have uh, rich versus poor. And it's never been like this. It's tearing apart the fabric of this country. And, uh, you know, we're not a United States anymore whatsoever. And, you know, I remember a country where, where viewpoints were respected. If we never listen to each other's viewpoint with respect, we'll never learn. And I think we're getting to a point where those types of statements are not really outlandish whatsoever. Uh, Ray Dalio is a very, very smart man. Uh, I don't discount what he's saying. In fact, I kind of feel it. You can feel it um, to the point where there's just such hatred on either side, you know, um, and we never saw that before. We didn't see it really under Obama. It started with Trump. And uh, you can say what you want about him. The part that bothered me the most had nothing to do with him. It was the part that the right vilified him in such a way, the left did, excuse me, vilified him in such a way that just respecting the office of the presidency was something that disrespecting it that I found uh, very distasteful. And, you know, I, I think that, it, 
you don't have to, to be in the camp of someone, but you should also respect. And I think uh, we've lost a lot of respect uh, in this country and, and respect for each other. And I think a lot of people around the world have lost respect for us as well. And, um, you know, the United States, while it's still very strong, but it's losing its wealth and it's losing its power. And, and that's thanks to things like the large deficits or the embarrassment in Afghanistan or the rise of Marxism or the woke wokeness of this country. Um, I think for these are the reasons that you buy precious metals to mitigate these long-term risks, which I think are coming. I think Ray Dalio is right. <laughs> yeah. So then how do precious metals fit into this narrative? What does it even mean for them? And you know, if you want to close out on where people can go to buy them as a CEO of Miles Franklin. Gold and silver, Elliot, to me, are something I hope I never need to use. And if I do, I'm damn glad I have it. And it's not just for an emergency. It's an opportunity as well. But at the same time, if I don't, I'll pass it on to my kids and know that in the year 3000, it's going to be worth something when the dollar bills in our wallets are hanging from a frame in the Smithsonian. So with that being said, um, if I could just simply say gold and silver are wealth, period, not an investment. And, and that's the way that I tell people to own it and structure their portfolios accordingly so that it's not rare or esoteric pieces, but rather fully enriched, uh, very liquid, very non-subjective approach. Anyways, as far as getting in touch with us, <laughs> like I said last time, I'd like your listeners to uh, put uh, in the subject line early stage investor and send it to info at Miles Franklin. We'll send them a, a, a weekly updated price list. One of my brokers or myself will reach out to them and I will promise the best price in the United States. And as we've talked about before, our corporate office in Minnesota, where we are located, is the only state in America that regulates a federally non-regulated industry. So on top of an A-plus rating, on top of being one of only 24 U.S. Mint representatives in the world, on top of the fact that we've never had a customer complaint, the state of Minnesota backs everything we do with surety bond, annual background checks, licensing compliance that no one else in the country has to abide by, but maybe one or two companies who have decided to also be accountable to the Department of Commerce in the state of Minnesota and do their background checks annually, pay a large surety bond, do all of these things. Most every company in America says, screw it, I'm not gonna do business in Minnesota. And it's the only state in America that regulates what is federally non-regulated. So not only will I promise your listeners personal service, the best price, but it will also be the safest transaction in the United States far enough. This discussion is for informational purposes only. Nothing in this discussion should be taken as investment advice. Guests are not compensated for their appearance. Do not base any investment decisions on the information presented.